Eric, welcome. For, for people don't, that aren't as familiar with your, your company, you, you say you offer extreme value in groceries. What, what is the model? How, how, do you, how are you able to do that, and can you do that in this environment? That, that's right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having us on. Um, the model is pretty simple to describe. Uh, a lot of people would say it's the TJ Maxx of groceries. So we work directly with manufacturers buying um, opportunistic products, uh, sell it at a 40 to 60 percent saving and um, put it in front of customers. And, and um, right now, in particular, they're looking to stretch their dollars. So it's working really well. So sur surplus groceries, essentially, that, that exactly. maybe the stores overbought or that are maybe near the expiration date. So wh what's happening with pricing on, on that front? Are you still able to offer as much as 40 to 70 percent, I think you say, discount yeah. compared we to regular groceries? Yeah, we are. Um, what we do is we price next to um, the nearest competitor, which in most cases is a traditional grocer. Um, uh, everyone's taking prices up. Um, unfortunately, we've seen, you know, unprecedented increases from manufacturers. So we've had to take prices up um, fittingly to make sure that um, we can stay relevant and stay competitive at the same time. So um, we do a lot of uh, price surveys, a lot of price checks, and we make sure that we're always the, the cheapest guy in town, um, no matter who we're competing against. Are consumers trading into private label? Uh, what, what, what impact do you think that might have on certainly some of the companies we cover uh, that, uh, that have, uh, have name brand at stake? Yeah, I think there's a couple trends going on. I think there's a trade uh, away from big brands, which you, know, you guys just mentioned on the last segment. Unilever took about a 75% increase in Hellman's mayonnaise pricing. Um, that's mm. naturally going to have people trade into private label uh, products. And I think... Um, there, there's a movement to sort of more regional brands, smaller brands that maybe we haven't heard of. You just walk through a Whole Foods or uh, one of the competitors and you can see a lot of brands that, you know, weren't necessarily um, number one, number two or number three brands. So I think people are trading, looking for values. And then certainly for, for us, uh, people are just coming in, wandering in because we're doing a lot of marketing in, in, uh, in our markets around the value that we, we present. And uh, they're very curious and they're liking what they're seeing. Uh, Eric, I'm just curious about the company because I, I had not really focused on it. How are you securing your supplies? I mean, are you going right to the producers or is, to this extent that things are ex near their expiration? Are you actually going to other retailers? I'm just curious as to how you get your supply. Yeah, yeah, we have a, we have a, a really great buying department. Um, a lot of people, a lot of relationships direct with manufacturers. Uh, we're very fortunate that yeah, about 95% of what we're buying is domestically sourced. Um, so we have not been caught up in the kind of the macro of the, the supply chain that everyone else has been. Um, and, and we really don't do a lot of sourcing from other retailers. Um, there's just a well-worn path between manufacturers and grocery outlets. For all of this product, it's about 1% of U.S. production has to go to sort of this opportunistic channel. And that's where we play. And, and we've got relationships to go back 40, 50 years. They trust us because we represent their, their brands inside of our stores. We sell it quickly. We turn fast. Um, we don't put an excessive markup on it, and so they can rely on us as a trading partner time and time again. 